Welcome to all of you zooming in from the East Coast and the West Coast and uh, maybe other places in between. I'm Mary White, co-director of WEED and joined by WEED members Andre Singer Thompson, one of the first WEED board members and now a SEED member and new WEED members Lisa Zimmer Chu and Leslie Smith. Women Eco Art Dialogue this dialogue in, was started in 1996, and it's a volunteer-run collective of female-identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. Uh, this is a special event to dialogue about collaborative process, and we'll start with the land acknowledgement. And if you wish, please put in the chat your own land acknowledgement for your area. Weed's office sits on the territory of the Wichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichonio speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona tribe of Alameda County, near one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. We recognize the Muwiwa. Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the association of Remetush Ohlone who are researching and revitalizing and prepare, preserving Remetush Ohlone history and culture, and the confederated villages of Lejeune and the Segorate Land Trust who are working to return native land back to indigenous stewards, including a garden about six blocks away from me, or maybe 10 blocks. Um, have a little Zoom housekeeping. We're recording this session and please keep your audio muted during the presentation. The host may mute you if there's extra noise. The panel presentation will go on approximately till 5 p.m. And after the speakers finish, we will stop the first recording and start a second recording for questions and dialogue. If you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat and then we'll address them at the end. So with no further ado, I would, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Andre Singer Thompson, who's going to be our moderator. Thank you, Mary. Um, I want to warn everybody that I'm 85 and a digital gets, so I might need some help with the computer. <laughs> uh, so Mary, do I just start, are my, you can see me all right? Yes, so you can, people can select the group view or the speaker view, and you can start the introduction. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Women Art Eco Art Dialogue called WEED, W-E-A-D, and a special welcome to our new members. I'm Andre Singer Thompson, recently retired board member, one of the original board members, and your host for one of the many to come online discussions. Our panel today addresses the power and value of collaboration of we, W-E, working together with others, artists, scientists, writers, political activists, members in the community and the governments. The following four artists on our panel will discuss their own experiences working in communion with others. And I wanna give a big welcome to the first two speakers because they are our brand new WEED members with a big thank you for joining us. Lisa Zimmer Chu is a longtime political eco-activist educator who will discuss her work, Life Reimagined, and her work as a public muralist with Extinction Rebellion. Leslie Smith is the associate, was the Associate Vice Chancellor of Governmental Relations, artist, and longtime arts administrator, a real powerhouse, will discuss two large public political projects, Missing Students and Vulnerability, which is a collaboration of humans with local urban wild animals. And of course, Mary White is one of our elders, still on the WEED board, and one of our WEED elders like myself. And she is a glass and community artist and, will, and instructor and we'll discuss her flood level markers and um, and the, at the, which is a project from Boulder, Colorado and the birthplace of Silicon Valley project in Mountain View, a partnership with the Atataka tribal community in the Grand Bayou, Louisiana. 
And finally, myself, I will discuss my own 26 year collaboration with two other women, Elizabeth Stamick and Valerie Otani, calling ourselves Eva, and some of the works we did together. Also other collaborators, Susan Leibowitz Steinman and Mary, and then one of my own large installations. While each of us has a personal aesthetic and philosophy, we will show that we often grow and expand our individual views by collaborating with others, arriving at new images and ideas that we may not have had alone, and possibly reaching greater audiences as well. Each artist will talk approximately eight minutes, after which we would love to hear your feedback and questions. So without further ado, I welcome and introduce our new member at Weed, Lisa Zimmer Chu. Thank you, Andre. And for the dedicated work of all the members on this panel with a special shout out to Mary and all your hard work. And thank you all for being here. What a lovely welcome to Weed. Now for the big moment of the screen share. Good. Let me just get to the start. Oops. Sorry for the flipping. A little preview. My focus today is on what turned out to be my two big pandemic projects, both of which were co creative collaborations, one in concept and both in execution. Relationships are central to these project, as, projects, as is taking the time to move at the speed of trust, admittedly hard to do in our fast-paced, product-oriented culture. These projects worked best when participants let go of individual ownership and of opening ourselves to the truth that we don't know what we don't know. The magic of this type of collaboration is the very definition of gestalt. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We had different styles from graphic to expressionist to a representational and worked on different sections. We unified the whole by being willing to redo parts, seeking one another's advice and by working together over many months. When in doubt, we deferred to the lead artist, but ultimately we settled in in a way that allowed everyone space. Particular to this mural is the timing. Having space was a structural necessity. When we, we had been working together at our Extinction Rebellion art group meetings in person on a concept since fall of 2019 to submit to the Clarion Alley Mural Project in San Francisco. We jammed on several ideas, zeroing in on the firefighters. If you live in California, you know why. Representing a, a range of ways we can metaphorically put out the fires of the interconnected climate and justice crises. Our lead artist, Leona Rossetti, had a vision of also depicting the beauty of the alternative world and began creating sketches. Over more meetings and up to the last minute, we asked if she could incorporate concepts we wanted to include and our proposal was accepted. Our first meeting with the folks at Clarion Alley was canceled in March, 2020. But by summer, we were ready, masks on and got together outdoors weekly unless it was a red alert day. For several hours, painting, talking, sharing joys, frustrations, fears, and creating something that all of us found very satisfying, not just in the product, but in the process. Working together with this beautiful team was a life raft in what we universally experienced as scary and uncertain times. And we were addressing the issues through art. Testament to how much we loved creating together is the finicky detail we were adding at the end because we didn't want to stop. Working in Clarion Alley was also met, we also met any number of passers-by, as well as those who hung out and talked. They were mostly supportive, except for the woman who tagged us with a Sharpie in the early stages, with links about climate chaos being a hoax. But a diverse in every way group of people passed by and commented, encouraged, discussed, lamented, sang, danced, and hung out with us over many months. They are all a part of the resulting mural, which continues to invite the public to step in to join us. 
This final image though, was the last idea to make it into the mural long after Leana's final painting was complete. Being in Clarion Alley, sometimes with folks who had spent the night and were doing their daily hygiene routine when we arrived, we saw a glaring omission and that we hadn't depicted a healthy community. Because there was no guide, we struggled with it. The scale, the colors, the transition to parts below. Eventually, all of us took a turn and together we built this organic, sustainable, multi-perspective, color-filled community with love. It takes a village. This next project was conceived over six years ago when I carried the 1963 Milton Bradley Game of Life on a cross-country voyage with my family, but never actually worked on it. It would be a parody on that era of explosive consumption and was based on the premise that in order to change culture, we have to change the very object of the game. Instead of winning by having the most money at retirement, the object would be to create a sustainable planet for generations of life to come. But the more I mold over the massive scope, the clearer I was that I can only see through my own eyes, and this needed to be a collaborative project. I don't know what I don't know. The interconnected crises of coronavirus, racial and economic injustices, and the extinction and climate emergencies made me feel that the time was right for this big picture painting of a thousand words. With a foundation of equity and justice, it would present a multi-perspective kaleidoscope of many aspects of life, food, energy, nature, arts, decolonization. There are 21 fields in the game. With newfound inspiration, I worked on this assemblage of my vision and reached out for my first partnership with the Art of the Green New Deal, a San Francisco-based online journal of creative culture shift, showcasing artists' work about what is possible. There was a lot of reimagining going on at the time. The relationship with the Art of the Green New Deal led to connecting with Be the Green in Atlanta and Earth Games at the University of Washington now known together as Life Reimagined Collaborative. Everyone was game to flesh out the concept based on my prototype. So in the fall of 2020, we began a Zoom relationship from Seattle to Atlanta, getting together weekly to shape the project. And again, we supported each other through difficult times. We published the illustrated feature of Life Reimagined as a work in progress and invited viewers to collaborate by writing action cards for the game. Students of Earth Games at University of Washington developed the first version of a playable digital game. We all came to this project from very different backgrounds and without knowing where it would lead. Full confession, I am not a gamer, nor do I play one in this project. And I never would have initiated a digital game design. Reimagining life is dependent on the work of artists, game developers, coders, or organizers, scientists, students and educators, et cetera. Indeed, the truth that it takes each of us with our unique skills and perspectives, each doing what we can, when we can, made it into the game. Players strive to balance self, society, and sustainability points, which actually increase in value when they join together to work collaboratively. Reimagining life in the future requires the vision of people younger than me. And a digital game has been a fabulous medium for working across generations. We are an evolving, diverse, multi-generational group with a shared purpose and sense of urgency, committed to culture change by gamifying the actions players can take in the game and in real life. Now, many team members and several versions later, the work of the Life Reimagined Collaborative has inspired students, supporters, and more and more gamers to continue to create a final, fun, engaging digital game that offers a vision of how culture can change. I'm thrilled that my piece was a seed and amazed to see what it has and continues to become well beyond my own imagination. We don't know what we don't know. In fact, we don't have to know it all. But by reaching out, trusting each other, and working collaboratively, we can reimagine life. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Powerful and provocative work. Thank you so much, Jared. It was wonderful to see it.
And now I would like to introduce a real powerhouse in my life, <laughs> uh, an old student from years ago who has become really a powerhouse. And here she is, Leslie Smith. Oops, hang on a second, working on the, uh... okay, so you can see it, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. So collaboration, the power of we. So the first step in the power of we is uh, courage, commitment, caring, passion, trust, and a leap of faith. So in 2003, Governor Davis decided to um, cut enrollment at the community colleges and raise fees. And my boss, the chancellor at City College of San Francisco, came to me and said, Leslie, I want you to take 50,000 students to the state capitol to protest this. So I went up there, and the first thing they wanted me to do, the police at the capitol, the Sacramento and West Sac, wanted me to put my name down and sign that there would be absolutely no damage, that I would be responsible if any damage were to occur. So I uh, took that leap of faith. I have to admit, the first time I put that signature on, a, on that uh, piece of paper, it was uh, somewhat intimidating. But I have to say, after 12 years of marching, there wasn't one bit of damage. The students were interested in one thing, their education. So in 2003, we had a great turnout, the state chancellor, the um, president of the CEOs, the all of the students, the trustees, the um, faculty, the classified, everybody banded together and had one message, keep the doors open and keep the fees low. But it was a one day event and the budget in California is a much longer process. And so to influence public policy, you need more. And so we decided to bring in art to expand our influence and, and increase our capacity to implement the kind of policy changes that would benefit our students. So we created the Missing Student Project. And so um, these are pictures of the missing students. I'd like to call out Roger Baird, the chair of the ESL, excuse me, chair of the City College of San Francisco Art Department, who created this fabulous, fabulous. Golden, golden screw uh, to emphasize um, what was be, attempted being done to our students. Everybody turned out. We had everybody on our team, and this is the uh, speaker of the California Assembly, the chair of the Budget Committee, chair of Education. We had all of the fact, uh, many of the legislative meetings when we were talking. And so this is a collaboration, not only of the people who did the art, but of the students who were marching and of the policymakers and then of the larger uh, audience. We had tremendous press coverage. And in fact, the Republican columnist for the Sacramento Bee came out the next morning. This was the first march in 30 years, in Sa large scale march in, in um, 30 years in Sacramento. And he said, a new day is dawning for the community college. So we had, um, by doing that, we had basically two rules for the art. One is it all had to be back in San Francisco in time to march on March 15th. And we, um, so they had, because they had to screw down the, uh, it was too close to anthrax time. The people in the, the police in Sacramento were concerned that our students were going to fill those statues full of anthrax and put, so there was no projectiles and it had to be in uh, San Francisco by the Friday before so we could spend all weekend screwing them to the moving carts. So this is one of the first pieces to come back from San Luis Obispo College. And it's what budget cuts did to us. This is to emphasize there were no rules. We also had the 40 miles east of Bakersfield is a small college called Saracosa College, who even with two rules kept asking, we just can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it. And so they showed up that day with their own wheels and they had created this giant wheel of misfortune. So the art was exactly as people wanted it to be. And it was broad based. People had their children doing handprints, they, they were cutting holes in it. It was Native Americans were represented here from uh, City College of San Francisco. So, but it isn't over in March. March is when the budgets, the, when the legislature starts hearing the budget proposals. But in May, in the middle of May, they make the recommendations for the final uh, budget. And the students are all in taking finals at that time. So we held a vigil. And this is the lawn in front of City College of San Francisco. But we also had, um, took these statues and surrounded the state capitol with them because there were no students available and CBS covered um, all of that. Then when they make the decisions at the end June, 
we um, created, or I should say, Ken Kwok, a fellow student at Laney College, made 121 of these uh, porcelain statues to represent the missing students. And um, of course, where on earth would you find a studio where you could produce this kind of um, quantity of art? Well, uh, Andre Singer Thompson opened up her, her studio so that we created and spent. And the way that this worked is we showed up at, at the CEO, statewide CEO, e, CEO meeting in Oakland on a rainy day in November. And we were selling, we had a wet, two wet statues, a male and a female, and we we're trying to sell them for $450 a piece. So the incoming cha state chancellor, Mark Drummond, who was chancellor of Los Angeles Community College District said at lunch, I'm buying 10. So when that lunch was over, the gates opened and we were very lucky and we were off to a road. Although we ended up having about 50 different donors um, contributing substantial amounts of money. The, this project went all across the state. It went to many different community colleges. It went to shopping malls. This is here in Union Square. And um, so we were reaching out to the public. Many people were uh, that came from different states were impressed. The students from Gavilon College had uh, painted Bush on the butt. And they said, oh, we couldn't do that in Pennsylvania. And so, but the whole time we were raising money. So the t-shirts we were selling, um, the a student from Vista College had created the motto in the back, 2.9 million students care, count, vote. And I think that that is a still a very solid recommendation as we go forward. I'd like to call out my management assistant, Judy Sito, without whom this project never would have happened. The backs of the people here are statewide um, community college faculty leaders. So after that, we went on to the Student Success Project. This is Yerba Buena Gardens. And we had, um, they went to different conferences and this was, we, we photographed actual students. They told their success story. I don't remember anyone talking about their income. It was talking about how community colleges changed their lives for the better. So we had their story printed on the back and we had, we ordered a microphone so you could push a button and you can hear the student's story in their own voice. Again, there were no rules for the art. The students could make their own art or they could farm it out and do what they wanted. The important thing was to get the message across that we are, that the community college is for everyone. It's the power of we. After that, I went on, I was made the Richmond um, uh, Art Center Spotlight Artist of the Year uh, for 2021. And I was very interested in, in how we work with our wildlife in our own backyard. Uh, my grandfather was born on the Choctaw Reservation and I've grown up my whole life val valuing mother nature. And we have certainly, as the UN report came out in May of 2019, that humans are the cause of the sixth mass extinction. Oops. So this is about the disappearance of Native American women and also the of extinction. In this case, it's talking about the disappearing caribou. As we go through this process of not being we, but rather as being me versus they, um, we're, we traffic in wildlife and these beautiful birds are taken out of their homeland and Muslim women are also made frequently made victims. And so this is, uh, nobody likes to be a victim. And so again, I am very much in terms of sharing responsibility. Uh, mainly humans have caused this extinction and we need to step up to the plate. This is called teamwork. And it's about how we need to work together to end the climate change as those Arctic shelves fall off in South America, um, in Antarctica. This of course references the horrific fires in um, Australia with the animals pleading to the humans to stop destroying their homes. Uh, nobody needs a mink coat. And I think the minks speak quite clearly their, of their emotion about keeping their own fur. In January of, 2020, um, I had an opossum um, come into my garage. I called a wildlife center and they told me I should do everything possible to get that opossum out. The opossum would not leave. So I built tunnels for her. I fed her, I created um, pee pads and she, we had a whole pattern where one day she'd go on this side and then I clean up that side and then she'd go to the other side and explore different tunnels. But unfortunately she did die of the rat poison. She came to me, she knew who had done it and she was asking for humans to help. Opossums are great neighbors and I'll never get over losing her. So this is 
talking again about um, the vulnerability of climate change. I'm sorry about that. And th this is uh, was inspired to a little bit about um, Penguin Town. I don't know if anybody watches it, but even when you work together, the fact that climate change is just so overwhelming at this point that is very, very tragic situation. Um, as a sculptor, I wanted to bring uh, a 3D image. And so we have the penguin. We have um, people that wear those um, long eyelashes. Unfortunately, many times they're a, um, an agora rabbit this is its life for that uh, beauty. Um, this is the pleen, meant to represent the pleen of the koala babies to please help them, of which many students, uh, many people stepped up. And of course, this is the ode to the opossum. Um, and we call it opossum magic. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be able to do this as a new member of WEED. I am so proud to share this with my uh, three other colleagues. Thank you. Um, that was so fantastic, Leslie, but you already know how much I love your work. But um, I, I just want to say how lucky Reed is to have both of you now as part of our membership. Um, and I certainly hope that more women artists will uh, take your lead and join us because it's getting to be a richer and richer organization with all these new people. So thank you so much. So next we come to the elders <laughs> and that's Mary and um, myself. And uh, Mary is still very much a board member. I have retired recently, but Mary is still a very active board member. So next is Mary White. Hi, I'm going to be sharing three projects that I've been working on. One in Boulder, Colorado, that took six years. Another one that took just a couple of years that was a smaller project and less interface with the community. And third project in Grand Bayou, Louisiana with a Akataka tribe, my favorite kind of ongoing community projects. Boulder, Colorado has a flood issue. You can see from the blue that the if there is a flood, a large, a large part of downtown Boulder and the high school and the student housing would be affected. So this project came with a lot of interest from a lot of people. I had moved to Boulder in 2004 and I knew there was a problem because my father was a geographer who had been pleading with the city not to build on the floodplain for years. So I built a little timeline in the upper left, which was a little model of a marker that might show the levels using art. I, joke to use art to change perceptions. When my father died in 2005, a group of community members heard about my idea and approached me to help lead a flood marker project. And then in the second circle at the top, it says 2006 to 2010. That's when we assembled floodplain managers, engineers, community activists, a stone sculptor, and we began meeting regularly. It was kind of an outreach to a whole town. We met multiple meetings with Parks and Rec, City Council, Engineering, Public Works. We fundraised the 100,200 from multiple sources. It was a really, um, project that took a long time in the center part. Then in 2010, we could start working on the signage and installing. And by 2011, we had dedicated it and given it to the city of Boulder for their use. So the project, here I am, making the markers in my in uh, a friend's studio in Oakland. And here's Christian 
putting on the final cap pieces of the marker on site in Boulder. And he was the stone sculptor, so he did all the stone part of it. Another shot of uh, the stone at the bottom. And you can see this is the site that the city thought would be good. This kind of collaboration takes patience, vision, stamina, respect, and attention to many opinions and beliefs. It means believing in an idea and then being willing to flex and change and adjust and learn as the project evolves. For instance, this very uh, straight flood marker was not my original idea. It was going to be wiggly, but we had too many people involved who wanted it to be very regular and it felt that was the only way to get it approved by the architects, the city planners, and the city council. There it is with the signage. And one of the important things about signage is to remember what to do if there is a flood and the famous sign of climb to safety in a flash flood is very important. So this has become a real center of conversations and interest in floodplain management in Boulder. Here I am with a visitor from the EPA. He's got his hand on the 50 year level and I've got my hand on the 100 year level. And this was the flood in 2013. So it hasn't been the big one yet. The, the marking up at the top is the um, big Thompson level. So that's the level that some point will probably come. The second collaboration was with a developer who was tearing down this lab in the Mountain View and wanted to build a big innovation center. And this is the site where the first diodes and transistors were built in the California area. So we did a lot of research. I found a metal sculptor, Vicki Jo Sewell, who I asked to collaborate with me. And we built a small transistor and a diode on a circuit board. There's a lot of controversy from the engineers. They didn't want the legs bent, but the architects did. But we didn't have to deal with the city. The architects and the developers dealt with the city. So it was a much simpler project than the other one. Here I am, this is the scale on the transistor. Vicki Joe's in the background, I'm putting in the glass. And this is what it ended up looking like with this plugged into the circuit board at 391 San Antonio Road in Mountain View. Another piece of shot for scale and at night. Another shot at night. So it was very effective. It created the history of a place. And my lesson that I learned from this is that when I did the research, I had realized that Santa Clara County was the breadbasket of California and that they had more orchards in that area and that this transition from the 50s to the 70s was from fruit to electronics. So I did a whole series of pieces about the lost orchards of the Silicon Valley. These are glass apricots that I made. They're not real, I made blue them and um, on glass leaves. And I did a piece with the map of the Santa Clara County down below showing the loss of the orchards. The third project is one that involves the Akataka tribe, which live in an area down at the very bottom of the Plaquemines Parish. The little, little line that goes out at the bottom of the screen. And they are losing their land at a very, very fast rate. And I met them at the Natural Hazards Conference in Boulder, Colorado. They were predicting that there might be a big storm that would take down their church. And sure enough, on the right is Rosina and Reverend Binney. And 
the church was lost all except the steeple. And I had offered to build new stained glass windows for their new church. And if you, on their left, they came to me in 2017 and said, look, the church is almost built. Come on down and help us build some stained glass windows. So you can see it's on an island. The shrimp boats are all around on the docks. It's really an amazing part of the world. And this was the crew I collaborated with, Rosina with sunglasses, was the main matriarch of the tribe. And she introduced me to the youth who came with me to California to learn about stained glass. And then we took them down to Abiquiu, New Mexico to take a stained glass class and meet indigenous youth from around the Southwest. And we all gathered at, in Louisiana when all the glass was made to put it on the shrimp boat and take it over to the church to install. And these are, there were six little windows. They're all based on the tribal artwork. Paul, um, Paul's shrimp boat, uh, Rosina's drawings of bayou animals, the burial site, and there are three more. And then this is the church and the altar. And this is the land, the sky, and the water. And it doesn't look elegant yet because the light box hadn't been hooked up, but it gives you a sense of this collaboration. So here I was in the midst of many collaborations in this one because the two ladies on the right are sociologists who work with the tribe and created the Lowlander community organization that helps with sea level rise. And I was brought in as yet another collaborator for this group of people who already know a lot about working together and the power of we. So thank you. Those are my three pres presentations. So, um... Unlike the things you just saw, I'm gonna talk about the process of actually collaborating with two other women uh, that I worked with for 26 years. Valerie Otani, who has unfortunately passed uh, last year, and Elizabeth Stanek and myself. And we were known as Eva, Elizabeth, Valerie, and Andre. Um, we were friends in the clay world, but we only started to work together in graduate school at San Francisco State. But we worked together for the next 26 years. So we would meet every Friday. We would do all our own work the rest of the time, but Friday was our collaborative day. We would meet uh, at a site that we were interested in. Um, and most of the work ended up being about the environment. But uh, that happened later. In the beginning, we were really just interested in creating something beautiful or provocative that brought attention to the site. We would go to that site, talk about its attributes, what we responded to, then each of us would go home and create an idea for the place. Then we remet and we shared our individual ideas and pooled them until a communal project emerged. It was always a process of giving up something of ourselves in order to create something more unique to the collaboration. One of my favorite pieces that we did together uh, for the Inseca conference was called Clay in Change. So in this work, all of the pieces are about the environment and they're all in a process of change, either breaking down um, or drying up. The left side of the gallery had uh, tubes bringing hose and water into the piece. This meant that as you, as the viewer stepped forward, the water would come on and then the piece would start to disintegrate. And if they stepped back, the water stopped and they came to understand that they were responsible for the disintegration of the piece. On the right side of the gallery, we had heat waves, so our work was wet, as you can see on the screens on the back. 
and then we had heat lamps. And uh, the heat lamps were constantly drying out the wet pieces. So these are all referencing um, the uh, environmental situation. And of course, uh, individual pieces uh, addressed uh, endangered species, etc. This was a piece that was originally looked like a bunch of rocks. And as people came up to it, they would start to disintegrate. At the opening, the woman came, a woman, I was standing near this, and a woman came up to me and said, whoa, what beautiful rocks, where did you get them? I said, oh no, we made them, Elizabeth and I made them. And she said, oh, how long did that take? And I said, several weeks, we first had to make them. And then before we fired, they are not fired. And so we had to polish them with a shiny stone called burnishing. And uh, as she stepped forward and the water came on, she suddenly said, oh my, oh my goodness, something that is that labor intensive and so beautiful is going to disappear. And I said, bingo. This is a piece that we did together in Monterey, California, uh, called Cannery Row Catch. And Cannery Row was dependent on the sardine industry. And the sardines had disappeared. And so the major industry in Monterey had to fold because there were no more sardines. However, there were these tanks on the beach which is where the ships would come in and dump the sardines as a holding tank. And those tanks remained as an artifact on the beach. We worked with the city government there and collaborated with them to get permission to do a piece in here about the sardines, honoring the sardine industry. And they gave us um, local prisoners from the prison to help us create the piece. So we had them pick up stones that they found on the beach and we created sardines in the can. And at the end we had a mirror so it reflected and it looked like it was a very long sardine can. And of course, for the opening, we covered it with metal and unwrapped it as you would a sardine can. So this is my individual piece. I, I didn't say individual, it took many, many collaborators and helpers and um, assistants, students and friends and artists. And my main collaborator was William Wareham, who um, this fish is uh, 50 feet wide and is made of 800 aluminum printing plates. Everything is recycled. And it's brightly colored now because we had to redo the whole piece when they retrofitted that brick wall. But the original fish on the wall was that color. When we took it down, we repainted it so it was brighter. So this was an image of the opening of the piece. There were waves um, that the local metal companies made for us that went all the way around the building. And in the courtyard, there was a glass globe dripping water into Alhambra bottle. And in the uh, courtyard, we had painted waves. So the fish is jumping out of the waves. And then the children in the uh, Art, Richmond Art Center, where this was in Richmond, California, the children would paint endangered species on the sidewalk for the duration of the show. Inside the gallery, um, we had children's drawings and paintings, and then I invited other uh, artists to add pieces about their ideas about disappearing water. At the end, there was an um, information wall about oh, disappearing water. And of course, this was in 1997. Another collaborator, this is a piece at the um, Berkeley City uh, Transfer Station. And we built these towers made out of the cans, uh, bulks of cans, and created an archway into a garden and invited people to draw on the sidewalk uh, where um, about images and ideas about recycling. 
and oops, sorry. Um, and then we created a garden in the middle of the space and had activities so that the children and people there would become more conscious of how important recycling was uh, and how it related to plants and nature. The pieces that I did with, uh, with uh, Susan Lieber with Steinman, it was always important to her that there are activities involving children and uh, because she always felt that teaching about the environment uh, to the younger generation was a very important part of our work. The final piece is this uh, fountain. And this was um, a piece that I did with Mary White and Christina Bertea. And this was at the Bioneers Conference. So the fountain that we made, the little pool that we created, uh, was aligned with Mary's homemade blue bricks. But this was the entire site. And we invited people to come and talk about um, the importance of water based on the idea. We called it a gathering place because traditionally where people gathered to get water became a gathering place to talk about the importance. So it was both community and the power of the water. So at the conference, we invited them to make a wish to talk to each other about the importance of water. And it was in conjunction with a, a work that Betsy Damon was presenting inside the conference on world water. Our gathering place referenced a sacred space to honor water, which is the most essential thing to our lives and is become probably the most important environmental issue of our time. Finally, one of my favorite collaborations was my car that I drove for many years, long gone now. But I invited family, friends, strangers, students, and anyone else interested. Sometimes people would see the car on the freeway and follow us off because they wanted to see it. And then I would invite them to paint an endangered species on the car. So that's it. Thank you. And now Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. So thank you, everyone. I think what we're going to do, we wanted to just put it on to group share. If everybody can change their view to the group share so you can see. Oh, OK, Andre, you need to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Here, hold on. There we go. All right. Okay, so great. We have a great crowd. So if anybody would like to maybe in the chat or can raise their hands or just wave if they have been working on collaborative projects in the last year. All right, I think what we'll do is we will close this part of the session.